direction. We're talking about everything we do to try to accomplish five things when it comes to offenders. Okay? And the five things we're trying to accomplish, the five goals of corrections are retribution. Now, that's not meant to be brutal or torturous, <clears throat> but it dates all the way back to the ancient societies and the whole concept of lex talionis and retribution. We've modified that and refined that as modern societies to look at retribution. Basically, retribution boils down to the fact that we believe, as a society, typically, that when people engage in criminal behavior, uh, we believe they should be held accountable for that. Now, I know there's a little confusion about that in some major metropolitan areas where they think if people commit a crime, you ought to book them in and then send them on their way. I don't know whose stupid ass idea that was, but, uh, but that's sending the wrong message. Now, I haven't told you too much about me yet, but here's why that's a stupid kind of thing to be doing. I spent 31 years operating, managing, and working in prisons and jails. I've been around the block more than a time or two. I know more Mexican mafia members than I like to think about. You know? uh, <clears throat> if you were to ask me, well, are they, that the only group you know anything about? No, then there's the Banditos, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, the Texas Syndicate, uh, the Black Gorilla Family, uh, La Nuestra Familia, the HPL, Barrios Azteca, Aryan Circle, Aryan Right. I hope I don't need to keep going, but there's a bunch of them. So, uh, and over the course of 31 years, I've dealt with all those folks. Uh, not every single member of that group, but enough to know what they're all about. And some of these folks that think you ought to get uh, kind of laid back and reform your bail requirements and let people out that have committed a crime, only to have them come back for something more serious. Mm. Some of those uh, politicians need to find themselves in a courtroom being sued for failure to protect. That's what that's called. Because they have a legal obligation. Offenders, in order to say to the general public, don't do this. There are consequences. There's accountability. If you engage in criminal behavior, there's some accountability uh, for that. There are consequences for that. And so we want to try and deter people from engaging in criminal behavior. Right? So general deterrence, using punishment against offenders to convince the general public not to engage in crime. Any question there? Okay. The other major type of deterrence is called specific deterrence. Specific deterrence is when we impose a sanction against a specific individual uh, we impose sanctions against a specific individual to convince that offender not to engage in crime in the future. We don't want to see you back in prison. Okay? So, now, how well does that work for us? Yeah, not very well. As much as I hate to tell you this, <clears throat> as much as we do to offenders in terms of corrections, no matter how many people we lock up in jail, no matter how many people we put in prison, no matter how many people are on probation or we put on parole or engage in some type of community, crime still occurs. Right. Why do you think that's true? Because we're more at outward for this. At, there you go. That's an important issue. Uh, and it's actually related to your discussion question. So is this whole idea of deterrence. That's why I'm going to spend a little time here. But uh, most of the time when the inmates come into prison uh, and we interview them, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, why they're here, what did they do, do they understand why they're in prison, those kinds of things. As you talk with them and have a conversation with them, sooner or later this is something that you hear from them. I can't believe him here because I didn't think I'd get caught. Right? So it's that kind of attitude that takes away the teeth of deterrence. When people believe that 
there's not going to be any uh, risk of apprehension, that there's not going to be any risk of prosecution, then the law becomes irrelevant to them. And they are committed to a criminal lifestyle that it may be impossible to get them out of. Right? So, uh, now, what do you think is the most important aspect of punishment uh, or the imposition of sanctions? Do you think it should be uh, swift, certain, or severe, or all three? All three. Okay, most people think it ought to be all three. Okay. Uh, oh, certainly. No. Oh, go ahead. Swift and certain. Okay. Swift and certain. All right. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about the classical school of criminology, you're going to find that Beccaria and Bentham, the two early proponents of the classical school of criminology, thought that in order to protect society and to keep society safe, deterrence was the key. <laughs> and the only way deterrence of either kind would work is if sanctions, if punishments were swift, certain, and severe. Now, it's important to know, what do they mean by severe, though? Well, one of the things that uh, Bentham and Beccaria spoke out against when it comes to corrections is that it does not need to be a form of torture. It does not need to be brutal, and it should not be inhumane. Originally, Beccaria and Bentham were both opposed to the use of the death penalty. But over the course of time, they came to realize that there are certain people in a society that are predators. And an execution may be the only answer for dealing with them. Okay? So, let's think about that for a minute. When you, what do you think inmates are concerned about? Punishment that's swift, certain, or severe? Swift. What's that? Swift. How many, how many times do you think of an offender is going to say, yeah, I'm concerned about swift punishment? Anybody? You go there? Well, to get out. To get out of, if you want to get out of a, you know, not prison, but um, county. Okay. You would want it. Okay. They might want to get out of there as quick as they can. I understand that, okay? But as far as imposing sanctions against them for their offense, do you think they're most concerned about it being swift or certain or severe? Severe. Severe. Okay. How many of you think it's severe? Okay. Well, I, uh, inmates are more concerned about certainty mm -hmm. of apprehension. Every inmate knows, every criminal offender knows that if they commit a crime and they get caught, there's punishment for that. They have figured that part out. Okay? What they're most concerned is whether or not they're going to get caught. That's why during the course of the interviews, that's what they come up with a lot of the times as they try and explain, well, here's why I'm here. You know, This is what I did, and I didn't think I'd get caught. I thought I planned this. I thought I was slick enough. I thought I was smart enough to outmaneuver the criminal justice system, specifically the police, and I wouldn't get caught. And then you look at their criminal record and you see, well, you know, you've got 15 robberies here. Looks like they sent you here for number 16. So yeah, you got away with it a while, for a while. And that's not uncommon to see criminal records and criminal history for these folks where they've had more than one criminal offense. And one of the things inmates get concerned about is that third felony conviction. Because that means, in Texas, as well as many other states, a mandatory life sentence. Okay? So they're not concerned with punishment and severity. They know that's what will take place if they get caught. What they're most concerned about is certainty. The certainty of apprehension. And that's related to the classical school of criminology. Again, where Beccaria and Bentham were very em emphatic about uh, uh, punishment. In order for punishment to be a deterrent, it's gotta be swift, certain, and severe. That adds to that whole concept of deterrence. Right? So, <clears throat> uh, and how do we know, do, do you think, uh, 
Do you think police presence is an important factor in preventing crime? No. They got a bunch of no's out there. No. I'd have to disagree with you. I think it's in an essential part of crime prevention. And you, how do I know that? Well, How many back, of you drive on one of the great thoroughfares of San Antonio? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go I ahead. Was, I just said your background has been awarded. Uh, <laughs> uh, because if the police don't apprehend uh, people to take them to court, then nobody shows up at my place <laughs> or what used to be my place. But here's something else I want you to think about. Uh, how many of you drive I-35, 10, 281, 90, any of the major thoroughfares, right? Uh, everybody that's, uh, who are the I-35 folks? Okay, everybody driving on I-35 is absolutely doing the speed limit. <laughs> now, now, they're probably 15 or 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, right? Okay. Now you folks that are on I-10, it's probably just as bad, if not the same. 281 is the same, 90 is the same. Uh, so, but here's what happens. I drive back and forth between here and New Braunfels every day. Okay. And so when I'm driving along, I'm probably driving with the flow of traffic. That's my excuse anyway. Uh, and so I'm probably doing 75 or 80 most of the time. Most of the time when I drive through downtown San Antonio on I-35, I'm doing 75 miles an hour. So yeah, I'm a criminal. I'm being just straight up with you. Right? But there's an interesting thing that happens. Not every day, but every once in a while, traffic's moving along 15 miles an hour over the speed limit and an SAPD <laughs> SUV pulls up on the freeway. Everybody slows down, even the people that aren't speeding. Okay? <laughs> Nobody will pass them. Uh, what's that? Nobody will pass them, even if they're going below. That, that's right, and nobody's going to pass him, <laughs> him or her, whoever it might be. And here's what's interesting about that is I was uh, coming here the other day, uh, one day last week, the person in the police car was from Hayes County. Yeah, out of the jurisdiction. Now, they don't have any jurisdiction here in Bear County or in San Antonio, but what's everybody doing? Well, we're slowing down, you know. Okay. And then as soon as they get off the freeway, what happens? Everybody gets back to where they were. My point is this. When the police are around, people behave for the most part. There may be some that will roll the dice and decide, oh, I think I can get past that. But again, most of us, even the, even the criminals, when the police show up, they change their attitude and they change their behavior. And why do they do that? Because they don't want anybody asking them any real serious questions. They don't want to attract any attention to themselves. And if you're a member of the Mexican Mafia or the Texas Syndicate or the HPL, the last thing you want is any attention from the police because that will ruin your business. What kind of business are we talking about? Right. Typically drugs, okay. Uh, the Mexican Mafia likes to deal with drugs of almost every kind. Only thing they don't deal with is meth, okay. Who in San Antonio and Bear County takes care of your meth issues? Banditos. Yes, the Banditos, an outlaw motorcycle club. I don't care what they do. Uh, <laughs> um, but the other thing that the Mexican Mafia has figured out is, is kind of lucrative is dealing in illegal weapons, running an illegal market in weapons. And then the next best thing to do is get involved in human smuggling. Not human trafficking, but human smuggling. What's what's the difference between trafficking and smuggling? Coyotes. Okay. Smuggling is when we move people from country A to country B, and we charge them about $10,000 for that, and then when we get to a stopping point, we just open the back of that 18-wheeler uh, trailer and tell them, okay, here you are, you're out, you're on your own, uh, you paid your money, bye, 
good luck, you know, and, and seriously, they're on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, they have a close encounter with the U.S. Border Patrol, but um, the Mexican Mafia doesn't do refunds, okay? Uh, trafficking is a whole new ballgame. People are trafficked for all of the following reasons. Forced labor, forced into commercial sex trade, prostitution and pornography, and for human organs. Okay? So, when it comes to trafficking of individuals for uh, commercial sex, here in the United States, how many do you think it is every year? 1.5 million. Okay. Now, and that's not trafficking somebody from Mexico to here. It's actually trafficking someone who's already here to someplace that's already here. It's like trafficking someone from uh, Minneapolis to Chicago, or Chicago to New York, or New York to Los Angeles, or Miami or uh, Houston. One and a half million people, U.S. citizens, being trafficked in the United States every year. Were you aware of that? Most people don't know, aren't aware of that number. Worldwide, it's close to three and a half to four million people that are trafficked. Now, if you don't know what the definition of slavery is, the best definition I can give you is human trafficking, modern day slavery. Right? So, <clears throat> some of the, the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because you, if you work in prisons, you're going to encounter people that do that kind of thing. And when it comes to trafficking, you've got two kind of people to deal with. You've got the traffickers, and they're about as they're about the scum of the earth, uh, or close to it. Um, and I don't say that to offend you. I hope it doesn't. But but they are. They are some of the lowest of the low. Now here's why that's important to you, wardens. Is because if you end up with a human trafficker in your prison, and they've been trafficking in little girls, and by little girls, I'm again, I don't mean any offense. But I mean little ones, age 9, 10, 11, and 12. You better hope that the rest of your general population inmates don't find out who they are. Because if they do, you're going to need a body bag. Because your other offenders that commit real manly crimes, they will take those traffickers out. And I mean, they'll kill them. That's all there is to it. Now... If that's not bad enough, you got traffickers, but then you got to be. Then you have to deal with the people that actually buy those services, mm -hmm. right? And they can be anybody. You know, traffickers can be anybody. Like the Elaine Maxwell Charles. Yeah, she's a trafficker, right? Mm -hmm. um, can't remember her name. This was a school teacher up near the up in the Dallas area. She was trafficking her students. Mm -hmm. Then there was the youth minister, and this was in Pennsylvania, trafficking uh, members of his youth group before he got caught. Mm -hmm. So again, the reason I say that is because traffickers can be just about anybody. The buyers of those services can be just about anybody. And again, if you find someone who's been purchasing uh, young women, little ones, girls, uh, and abusing them, if your inmate population finds out who they are, uh, they're good as dead. Okay. That's also going to apply to any sex offender that you have in your facility. Because real men and real women don't commit sex crimes. You know? In the hierarchy of your society of captives, this is how that'll work. Now, I'll get back to the five goals, I promise I will. Uh, so, uh, in your hierarchy of your society within your prison system, that society of captives, who's at the top of the food chain, do you think, in terms of the offense committed? Murderers. Murderers. They typically are at the very top of the food chain. Uh, everybody is afraid of them because they killed somebody. 
Uh, <clears throat> think about murderers, though. Murder tends to be a one-time event. Most people that are in prison for murder have only done that one time, and when they get out, they don't ever come back. They also tend to be some of your best offenders. Now, there's an exception to that. If they're a psychopath, you got a different kind of problem. Okay? If they're suffering from psychopathy uh, as a personality disorder, then that is going to be an individual to contend with. Uh, you can't necessarily segregate them uh, and get them away from the general population. But you're going to have to keep an eye on them because they will manipulate people. Mm -hmm. They will cause problems. They groom them. I, I've had two uh, federal clients as a substance abuse counselor that had personality disorders. Yeah. And they both tried to groom me into whatever they wanted out of treatment. And oh, yeah. And they're both back in prison. Yeah. So your staff have to be fairly well trained. As you take them through your training process, you need to talk to them about psychopaths. <clears throat> you may not have any in your facility, but then again, only takes one. Okay, and they're they're difficult to deal with. Right? <clears throat> so once we get past the murderers, the uh, and and they're pretty much going to be laid back. They're not all that, you know. They're all about com, uh, conforming to the rules. Murderers want to do their time and get out. Okay, they want to be left alone and just let me get out. Get my time done and get on out of here. So the next group down is what you have to be careful of. Those are your people who engage in aggravated assaults um, and robberies. Problem with them is they don't mind a confrontation. In fact, they're almost looking for one. Uh, they're going to be probably your most difficult group to handle in terms of inmate on inmate violence. They'll be the ones to watch out for. Right? The next group down, they're, they're again, they're kind of manipulators. They're your burglars, drug dealers, uh, car thieves. Uh, they're not looking for a confrontation, but they're looking to see what they can get for nothing. Okay? Uh, you have to watch out for them because they're out to steal from other offenders. And if those other offenders catch them stealing from them, you got an issue on your hands. Okay? One of the part of the inmate code is you do your own time and you don't steal from other offenders. You just don't do that. That will get you involved in a full contact basketball uh, game out on the rec yard. You'd be amazed at how many times somebody can bounce up off the concrete. Okay? So, all right. Um, let's see, who's next? Well, the next group down way down there are going to be sex offenders. Okay? Uh, again, keep in mind, your inmate population, all, all those up above them, they commit real crimes. They commit manly crimes. Those sex offenders, they're cowards. Picking on women and children, that's cowards. Okay? So based on your inmate society rules and your inmate code, those folks are not in good shape. Most of the time, as a warden, you're going to have to make a decision about where to house them. And most of the time, you're going to have to put them in protective custody to keep them from being killed. Okay. Yes, sir? Um, if they do end up being killed, is that somehow put against you as a warden or even maybe as a guard that was watching them? Uh, it very well could be because <clears throat> the key... U.S. Supreme Court decision there is Farmer versus Brennan. Okay. In Farmer versus Brennan, the United States Supreme Court ruled that as a warden, I'm not responsible for inmate on inmate violence as long as it's random, as long as there was nothing to indicate to me that there could be a problem here. Okay. But if I know or should have known that there was a problem or a threat against a particular offender, and I don't take steps to protect him or her, okay, then, and that person is killed, they die, I'm probably going to get sued for wrongful death. Okay? 
the last wrongful death lawsuit I had to deal with and testify during that situation in federal court, the court ruled that the uh, individuals who were at fault needed to pay out $42 million. So unless you're planning on winning the lottery, uh, and I mean the big lottery, uh, you're not going to want people dying in your facility if they're not on death row. And even if they're on death row, you don't want them dying until the court says they should. You know, that's just not a good plan. But, so, uh, any questions yet? Okay, now there's one more group in this society of captives that you have to be very careful of. And they're down, not at the bottom of the barrel, but they're outside the barrel, under the barrel, where all that mud's growing, okay? And those are confidential informants. If, as a warden, you cultivate a confidential informant that's going to kind of help you know what's going on with the inmate population, you need to make sure that you are the only one that knows who they are. The Inmate Information Network is second to none. It makes the internet look slow. <clears throat> if you've got a confidential informant and other inmates find out who it is, you're not gonna need one body bag, you're probably gonna need two or three, okay? It'll be awful. That's why, as a warden, I never used confidential informants. I always thought it was my job to know what was going on on my unit. I thought it was the responsibility of my officers and my supervisors, the captains, the lieutenants, the sergeants, the correctional officers. They're the ones that need to know what's going on on the unit so that I can talk to them and find out what's going on or they can come tell me what's going on. I don't want another inmate involved in that. Now, that's just me. You know, uh, I won't tell you what my staff used to call me. Uh, uh, I'll give you one here. I, I used to, because I was brought up in the Texas prison system and I wanted to work for the private corrections, I spent 15 years with the Texas prison system, 16 years in pri private corrections. And my staff in private corrections, they would refer to me as the ice man. Okay? Gee, you're cold blooded. Right? <laughs> Um, uh, I sometimes got referred to as the POD, Prince of Darkness, <laughs> because my, my staff would sometimes ask, how did you know that what was going to happen? Well, because I've been around in there, you know, work around them, you figure out what goes on and how they work and how they think, how they operate. All right. So you have to be careful about how you run your facility because you're going to have a lot of different folks to deal with. Now, within that society of captives, you're going to have some outliers over here. And you really have to watch out for them. And those are your security threat groups. It's going to be the Mexican Mafia, the Texas Syndicate, the Aryan Brotherhood. And you don't have just the Aryan Brotherhood, you got the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, right? And they don't get along with each other. They don't necessarily like each other, right? Uh, you cannot house Mexican Mafia members with the HPL. That's Hermanos Pistoleros Latino, Brotherhood of Latin Killers. They're pretty much up out of the uh, Nueces County, Corpus Christi area. You can't house them with Mexican Mafia. So as a warden, you're gonna have to be familiar with these security threat groups, and who can you put with someone without causing some real problems? You cannot put the Orejones from San Antonio with the Mexican Mafia in San Antonio. You will have a fight on your hands that will turn quickly into a riot. Right. I'll show you a video, might not get to it this evening, but I'll show you a video probably next week of how the Bear County Jail is having difficulty with Orejones. So, you have to be careful with security threat groups. If you're running a federal facility, you could have inmates from all over the country. <clears throat> and when it comes to the Mexican Mafia, you've got 
the Mexican Mafia of California, the Mexican Mafia of Arizona, the Mexican Mafia of New Mexico, and you've got the, the Mexican Mafia of Texas. You can't house all of them together. That's why you will, in all likelihood, have a security threat crew officer, typically the rank of a sergeant, and it's his or her responsibility to know who all of the security threat group members are that are on your pr prison unit, what security threat groups there are, who's coming into your facility, and who's leaving. Your security threat group sergeant is going to want to keep up with all of that. Okay. Housing the wrong person, there, there's that Farmer versus Brennan situation again. Knowing that you cannot put the Mexican Mafia, for example, with the HPL, <coughs> and that mistake gets made, some HPL member gets put in a sidewalk or a dormitory with Mexican Mafia members, that person ends up dead because they are at war with each other even to this day. Then you're going to find yourself in a courtroom, I guarantee it. Okay? And believe me, those are, those are not real pleasant situations. Okay? All right. Any questions or issues about anything up to this point? Okay, so here's what we've talked about in terms of the goals of corrections. We've talked about retribution, holding people accountable. We've talked about deterrence, special deterrence and uh, general deterrence, okay? Uh, the third goal of corrections, incapacitation. Uh, we're going to lock people up and manage and supervise them so that society is safer. How well is that working? Not well. Not well. Just because we lock people up, make no mistake, folks, just because you lock people up in prison doesn't mean they're going to stop committing crime. Okay? Uh, and what kind of crime do you think they're going to commit while they're incarcerated? They're going to order hits. Uh, they may order hits against individuals on the outside. They may order a hit against somebody on the inside. Okay? They can sell drugs from the inside. What's that? They can sell drugs within. Huh? Absolutely. If you got a drug problem in your facility, it's probably because you've got security threat groups having those drugs brought in. And who's going to be the ones bringing them in? Sorry. Okay, all that sounded good. It can be visitors. It might be officers that are compromised. Okay. So, yeah, that's how drugs get into your facility. Sometimes inmates will bring them in on their own, located in places that are very uh, private. Or what, yeah. Um, so uh, you'd be amazed at what offenders will hide in body cavities. Okay? So that's another way that drugs come in. Sometimes weapons come into your facility that way. Uh, so, uh, so they can order hits on the inside, on the outside. They can operate their drug business, their gun business, uh, their illegal market and and weapons. Uh, they, one of the things you have to be careful of, wardens, is money laundering. Because when inmates come into your facility, one of the things you're going to probably do for them is you're going to set up a trust fund account for them, and it's going to operate just like a checking account. When they get their ID issued to them, it's got that magnetic strip on the back. Okay? That means that when they have money on the books, they can go to the commissary and buy snacks and goodies and you know, soft drinks, they can buy, uh, if they wanted to buy some uh, different kind of soap, whatever it is, whatever you, whatever you as a warden allow your commissary to sell, that's what the inmates can buy, okay? But here's what you gotta be careful of, that they use your trust fund as a money laundering operation. It might go something like this. Inmate A has someone on the outside, girlfriend, um, and uh, every month, she sends in eleven, twelve hundred dollars to be put on the trust fund account, and every month the inmate sends out all but a hundred dollars back to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're laundering drug money. She's sending the money into him, stays in the trust fund account for, her, then he sends it back out to her, and it looks nice and clean. I actually caught two inmates doing that in my facility. Uh, 
and because they were federal inmates, reported that to the U.S. Marshals, and all of their money got confiscated. You talk about some individuals that were upset. You know? uh, so when you can't make that truck payment or that rent payment because that laundered money's not coming to you and it's in the hands of the feds, that kind of ruins your day. You know? Life in the fast lane. Uh, so those are all things you have to be careful of. Just because we've got people locked up doesn't mean they are not going to engage in criminal behavior. Okay? The fourth, uh, let's see, we've done uh, retribution, deterrence, incapacitation. Number four, rehabilitation. Okay? A major component of corrections is rehabilitation. Former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Warren Burke, uh, yeah, Warren Berger, uh, had this to say about pe putting people in prison. Putting people behind bars and doing nothing for them is the same thing as winning the battle and losing the war. It's expensive and it's stupid. Mm -hmm. He was making that comment to en encourage rehabilitation programs. Okay? And those are, that's pretty strong language coming from a chief justice or a former chief justice of the Supreme Court. Now he has since passed away, but uh, anyway. <coughs> what percentage of offenders, not only in Texas, but nationwide, do you think will ultimately get out and return to the community? Mm. Most people put the number at 90%, but 80, I'll buy that for sure. Uh, so ultimately, 80 to 90% of everybody that's in prison will ultimately get out and return to the community. That other uh, 10, 15, or 20%, those are the folks that are on death row, or they're doing life without parole, or again, they've got a mandatory life sentence. So they're probably not gonna be returning home anytime soon. So, with that in mind, one of the things we'd like to see is that when people leave prison, they don't come back. And if they don't come back, that means they're not committing other crimes. At least we hope they're not and or, or getting away with it. Here in Texas, to give you an idea of how we measure the effectiveness of rehabilitation, here in Texas, our recidivism rate, the rate at which people return to prison, used to be 72% at three years, meaning that for every 100 offenders released, within three years, 72 were back in prison. That ain't anything to write home and tell your mother about. Hmm. And then out at the five-year mark, it was 95%. Wow. Okay? For every 100 released in five years, 95 of them were back in. Right? One of the reasons for that is because in the early days of corrections, at least in the early days of modern corrections that were where we are now, rehabilitation programs either didn't exist, or if they did exist, they weren't any good. They were some fad or some fly by the seat of your pants kind of program. None of them had been empirically, scientifically evaluated. Evidence-based. Evidence-based, exactly. And those are the programs we implement today. We want to implement programs that we know can work. Evidence-based programs, and you'll hear that phrase a lot as we talk about not only correctional programs and probation and parole, but also things going on with the courts, things going on with the police in terms of, you know, dealing with gangs out on the street or dealing with security threat groups. We want programs of intervention and prevention that are gonna work. Only way we know that is if they've been evaluated scientifically, empirically, right? So, those are the kind of programs we use today and our recidivism rate today here in Texas is 44% at three years. Okay. Wow. That's a pretty good improvement. 
Do I think it could be better? Well, perhaps. Okay. Do I think it will ever be zero at three years? Absolutely not. And I say that to say this. If you're looking for perfection in the criminal justice system, if you're looking in 100% rehabilitation where nobody comes back to prison, I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to be disappointed. Okay. That just is not going to happen. Uh, there are two reasons for that. Number one, the criminal justice system is operated by human beings. Most of them are really good human beings. Most of them are trying to do their job, whether it's police, courts, or corrections, to the very best of their ability, to the extent that the law and the culture will allow them to do their job correctly. Okay? And in the research, what it tells us is that people that work in the criminal justice system, whether it's the police, or in the courts, or in corrections, about 80 to 85% of people that are in the system are honorable people, they are people of integrity, and they're working hard to do things the right way. Okay. The unfortunate reality is also this. There are people that work in the criminal justice system that need to be shown the door and told, get out, goodbye, please don't come back uh, because you're nothing but a lawsuit looking for a courtroom to happen in. And I know that the police and the criminal justice system, especially here recently, last couple of years, have faded a lot of heat. And let me qualify what I'm about to say this way. You don't always have to agree with what I tell you. Okay. You may not see it the same way I do. Okay. But from my perspective, it appears that the political machinery has gone out of their way to demonize the police and people that work in the criminal justice system. With all of the talk of reform, and we need to do things better, and we need to fix things, we need to do all of that kind of stuff to improve the criminal justice system. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's my, that's my ringtone as well. <laughs> all right. So, and the media... I don't know how to explain this except that the media lies to you a lot. I mean, bless their heart, they can't seem to help it. I think they mm -hmm. take some pills every morning to help them know how to lie to you. Anyway, uh, if it sounds like I'm kind of rough on the media, it's because I am. Okay? Because they do, they lie to you. <clears throat> I'll give you some examples of that here in a minute. Um, but <clears throat> without the, again, without the criminal justice system, the law means nothing. Now, I don't know if you want to live in a society like that, but I don't. Okay? I like having the police around. I like having the courts around. I like having correctional systems. I am not in favor of doing away with prisons and jails. There are folks out there that think prisons and jails are just so inhumane, we just ought to shut them all down. Now, here's when I find someone like that, this is what I ask them. Where do you live? Uh, what do you mean? Well, let me. what neighborhood do you live in? Oh, this is where I live. Really, there are any empty houses there? Well, yeah, there's some houses for sale there. Good, I think I'm going to come buy one. And I'm going to rent it out to the government. And I'm going to put 25 sex offenders in there. How's that sound for a plan? Oops. And then I tell them, you know, <clears throat> your neighbors are going to be upset about that. They're going to come ask me what in the world am I doing because their property values are going to drop like a rock. Not only that, they're going to be upset having all those sex offenders in their neighborhood. And you know what I'm going to tell them? I'm going to tell them it was your idea. Now that may sound cold-blooded, but there are actually neighborhoods in the United States where that's actually being done because there's not enough room in some prisons and jails. And so private citizens have bought homes to turn them into basically a halfway house. And a lot of people in that neighborhood don't even know they're there. So you may have some of those here in San Antonio and not know it. Anyway, so my point is this. I don't want to get rid of prisons and jails. 
There are too many people that kind of need to be in them, okay, instead of out walking the street because you might be the victim. And I'd rather not have that happen. Mm -hmm. So prisons and jails serve a very important function. Now, are there law enforcement officers that are corrupt? Yeah. Yeah, there are a few. Okay. Um, what about the courts? Any problems there? Mm -hmm. Got any corrupt lawyers or judges? Mm -hmm. mm, sure do. Do you ever hear about that, though, in the media? Oh, no. Almost never. Okay. But you do hear about law enforcement. And the reason for that is because they're the most visible component of the criminal justice system. Do you think there are correctional officers that engage in racial profiling? Yes. Yeah, I know that too because I've had to fire them. Okay? Because I wouldn't put up with that. I wouldn't tolerate that. I wouldn't tolerate that at my facility. So I'd get rid of them in a heartbeat. Okay? Uh, I also had to fire people that belonged to the Mexican mafia that got hired uh, by my human resource person. Uh, and, and that's a, that's a different story too. <laughs> so anyway, I've had to... So I've done my share of, of firing people to get them out of some place where they don't belong. Okay. Now, do we want the criminal justice system to be a system of integrity and honor? Yes. Absolutely. There's a lot of us that want that. There are a lot of good people that work in the criminal justice system. But the media will focus on those that are not, that are corrupt, or that engage in racial profiling, or that uh, inappropriately use force against someone. And that happens sometimes. And people are, for the most part, held accountable for that. Okay? But before you condemn the criminal justice system, let me ask you this. You got any corruption going on with General Motors? Sure you do. And how do I know that? Well, it's because they rolled a bunch of vehicles out of on their assembly line with a defective ignition switch that caused the airbag to deploy randomly, causing people to have accidents, and there were people killed as a result of that. And did GM know that that defective ignition switch was there? Yeah, they did, and they rolled them out anyway. Bless their heart. Yeah, it was only going to cost two dollars and eighty-five cents to fix them, and they decided, no, we don't want to do that. Whining and crying about it. Okay. Anybody here know anything about British Petroleum, Deepwater Horizon? Mm -hmm. Deepwater Horizon, one of the worst environmental disasters to hit the Gulf Coast. Okay. Deepwater Horizon was a drilling rig. It was a very unique kind of drilling rig. Uh, out in the Gulf and um, the people with British Petroleum because they didn't want to spend the money to kind of do some things right uh, they had a blowout preventer down there in the bottom of the ocean that wasn't the right kind and couldn't handle that pressure and it blows out ultimately to make a long story short it blows out blows up the entire rig 11 or uh, excuse me 15 people killed as a result of their negligence. We just don't want to spend that money because we'd rather put it in our pocket. 15 body, 15 souls died as a result. Now originally, those officials with British Petroleum were charged with manslaughter. But in 2015, all those, because that happened in 2010, 2015, all those charges were dropped. British Petroleum is still to this day being sued over all of that and paying out some $60 uh, billion. Dollars, okay? uh, so my point in talking to you about General Motors and British Petroleum is that no matter what organization you want to talk about, I guarantee you, you can find some bad actors in there that <clears throat> are making things tough on everybody else. Okay. Who was Bernie Madoff? In case you're wondering, oh, that couldn't happen in the finance industry. Well, look at Bernie Madoff, who was running a Ponzi scheme and cheated people out of $70 billion. That's billion with a B. 
Okay? My point is you can find people who are not people of honor, not people of integrity, in any organization of any size. So we need to be careful. My suggestion would be we have to be careful about pointing a finger at the criminal justice system because they're an organization just like any other operated by human beings and most of them are there doing a good job. Most of the people who work for GM and British Patrol, they are good, hard-working, decent people. No question about that. But there are folks that try to take advantage of the system and, some, and most of the time it's all about money. And people end up getting hurt. So, do we have some problems with the criminal justice system? All three components, absolutely. Do we need to try to reform that and fix that? Absolutely. But we don't need to throw the whole baby out with the bath, bath water, if you know what I mean. We don't need to crash the whole system just to take care of a few problems. We need to focus on what the problems are and fix that and leave the rest of it alone. You know, questions or issues about any of that? Okay, so we've talked about four goals of correction. The last goal for corrections is reintegration. We talked a little bit about uh, how inmates, somewhere between 80 and 90% of all inmates here in Texas and nationwide, over the course of time, will ultimately get out of prison and return to the community. Most of them are going to return to the community that they came from. Okay, because that's where they're going to have family and friends, okay, acquaintances. That's where they're going to know how things work and how things operate. When they return to their community, uh, some of them are going to get out of the criminal lifestyle. Some won't. Okay. Um, there will be a few that cannot return to the community that they came from, and they'll find themselves in a different community. Every once in a while when we try to parole somebody, we may, if they came from Bear County, we may not be able to parole them back to Bear County because they have no support, they have no family, they have no way of getting a, a job there, so we may have to send them up to Potter County, Amarillo, right? mm -hmm. or we might have to send them to Lubbock County or Midland County, right? and because nobody knows them, if they don't have any support, if they don't have any family, that makes it just the more difficult to reintegrate back into society and increases the risk that they will return to a criminal lifestyle. So we want to try to reintegrate people, offenders, in such a way that they are encouraged to become law-abiding citizens. To that end, here in Texas, and, and this is not uncommon, Individuals who go into the Texas prison system that don't have a high school diploma or a GED must complete one before they are released. Okay? Because that may not sound like any great educational process, but it's amazing how many employers will hire people that are ex-offenders as long as they've got a high school diploma or a GED. Now, does that help benefit those employers? Yes, they normally get a tax break from the Internal Revenue Service for hiring ex-offenders. And that's why there are some really good employers out there that, that will do that. But those offenders need to have an education to be able to apply for those jobs. Okay? And that's why here in Texas, we're very adamant about people coming into the system and leaving at least with a high school diploma or a GED. Okay. So those are your five goals of correction. Any question about those? Can you name them again? What's that? Can you name them? Uh, again, this. Retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, Rehabilitation, reintegration. 
Now, let me back up. Rehabilitation. How successful are we about that? Well, we've talked about our recidivism rate, 44% uh, overall, 44%. Uh, in other words, 44 out of every 100 come back to prison at the end of three years. Okay? Now, what is the fundamental key to making rehabilitation work? What's the key to making those programs actually work? Funding. Funding is a, you've got to have the appropriate funding so that you can bring on the appropriate uh, staff, whether it's counselors or teachers or psychologists, whoever it might be that operates your rehabilitation programs, teachers that can provide uh, vocational training in heating and air conditioning, diesel mechanics, uh, whatever it might be. So you've got to have the funding to put those programs in place and keep them in place, okay? So funding is important. What's, an, what's another issue? They have to actually go. Yes, offenders actually have to go to those programs, okay? Which brings up the key wardens, can you force people into a rehabilitation program? No, but the uh, federal corrections department here does a very good job of referring when we have a client that wants to leave, we just call them up and we tell them exactly what's on the line. Some stay, some you back to prison, and most will stay. Okay. Now, so you cannot force people into a rehabilitation program unless it is ordered by a court. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But what you can do is provide incentives for engaging in rehabilitation programs like in the Texas prison system. If I'm the offender, I get into prison, I find out, you know what? Uh, if I go to work and behave myself, I can earn 30 days of credit, of good time credit, for every 30 calendar days that I do. Hmm, but if I go over there and, and get enrolled in that diesel mechanics vocational course, they'll add another 10 days of good time credit. So now I'm earning 40 or 30. And if I go to that uh, counseling program for people with drug or alcohol problems, they'll get me all the way up to 45 days of good time credit for every 30 days I do. Hmm. Gee, that looks good to the parole board. Mm -hmm. I may not give a hoot about being rehabilitated, but I sure do want that to look good to the parole board, and that's what most inmates tell us as they conduct their or complete their surveys on the way out. Yeah, I, your rehabilitation programs were good, and I participated in them, but the only reason I did that is because it looked good to the parole board. Got me all that extra good time credit so I could get out early. They don't have any problem telling you that. It'd be straight up with you. But at least they went, at least they participated. And you never know how that might impact on someone's life. And that's why I would say to you as wardens, that you need to talk to your correctional staff, your correctional officers about being an example to those offenders because you never know who you might be able to reach. So, when it comes to rehabilitation, let me just say this. It's most effective when the person being rehabilitated actually wants to change. You cannot force people to change, and you can't threaten them enough or scare them enough to get them to change. But if they want to change and get away from that criminal lifestyle, if that's something they want to do, then they will. Okay. Seen it over and over and over again. So, questions or issues about any of this? Okay, all right. So, I think we've pretty well covered the definition of corrections and what corrections is. Okay. So, uh, let's see, we've been at this for about an hour. Are you doing okay? Okay, all right. So, um, when it, what it, it's also important to tell you that corrections is this, as we define what corrections is. 
It's the ability to provide a safe, secure, humane environment where individuals can complete their sentence as it has been imposed by the courts without fear of being abused or harmed while they're doing their time. Okay. Most of the time when you go to when, when you go to your prison unit, uh, it's going to be dull and boring. You're going to think that the only thing I'm doing is babysitting a bunch of adult guys or gals. Okay. Don't let that happen to you. And I know I'm talking to you as if you were going to go work in corrections because you might, then again, you might not. But at the same time, it is not beyond reason that some of you could find yourself working in corrections and be a, a building major, to be a warden, okay? So that's why I talk to you in this class the way I do because that's where you might be. You might find yourself running for election as a sheriff. Okay? I think that'd be a great thing for you if, that, if, that's, um, if that's the kind of career you wanted to pursue. Okay? Uh, if you think, oh, I'm too small to work in corrections, okay? let me just say this. When I was the deputy warden at the Kyle Correctional Facility up at Kyle, Texas, uh, it was run by the Wackenhut Corrections Corporation at the time. I had a young lady uh, that worked for me. Uh, she was a lieutenant. And I could stand next to her and put my hand on top of her head just like this. Okay. Now, don't take that the wrong way. That wasn't meant to be offensive or anything like that. I'm just trying to indicate to you how, what her size was. Okay. When it comes to use of force, you would not want to confront her. Uh, she'd throw your butt up against the wall and bounce you off the floor in a heartbeat. Okay? It didn't bother her one bit. And she could do that because she was properly trained to do that, to protect herself, to protect her officers if necessary, and to engage in a use of force when necessary and come out on top. And she could do that. So don't think that, oh, I'm too small or I'm just not good enough to work in corrections, okay? So uh, rest assured, uh, you are. Now, I will say this, are there some people that don't need to be working in corrections? Yeah, there's some. Uh, we'll talk about them when we get to the personnel uh, of that chapter. But again, uh, until otherwise indicated, uh, I don't see any reason why any of you couldn't be working in a correctional facility. Okay. For me, working in a correctional facility, again, I started with the Texas prison system. Um, and as we were developed in that system as correctional officers and supervisors, um, we didn't put up with anything. Okay. Uh, inmates knew they could not tell us what to do. Um, that it was our job to tell them what to do. Um, now, not everybody sees corrections that way today. Uh, corrections nationwide is changing. What we're seeing within correctional systems today is they're doing away with things like solitary confinement or disciplinary detention. That's two different names for the same thing. Many of them are doing away with administrative segregation. Okay? Uh, so uh, if someone, if an offender violates the rules and gets into trouble, systems are imposing cell restriction so that they just stay in their cell instead of being segregated from the population in disciplinary detention or administrative segregation. Now, supermax facilities are still in use. We operate one supermax facility here in Texas. It's over at Huntsville. Okay. California has one. It's uh, Pelican Bay. Uh, the federal prison system operates a supermax at Florence, Colorado. Okay. 
So almost everybody has got a version of a Supermax facility. So, uh, questions or issues? No. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the correctional enterprise, we're trying to correct or put right the attitude <coughs> and behavior of the clientele. Uh, and the clientele are who? Okay, they're the offender. Now, uh, here's why I'm, I'm going to. Uh, <clears throat> One of the issues that's, that goes on in corrections is what do you call an offender? What do you call an inmate? Right? Well, back in the day, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they were convicts. Right? We get into the late 60s, early into the early 70s, uh, and into the 80s they became inmates. Okay. Get past the 80s and into the 20, the 2000 and where uh, up to until about two years ago, they were offenders. Okay. Unless they were in a jail and then they were detainees because they hadn't been convicted of anything. So we've had a hard time trying to figure out what to call these folks. Um, and in some systems, we're back to calling them inmates uh, and in some systems, they're into calling them Mr. and their last name. Now, there are some correctional folks that have been around for a long time that don't like that. Okay? But I will say this. One of the most important things about running a correctional facility and maintaining the peace is to develop a level of respect between you, if you're the warden, your offenders and your staff, your correctional officers and the offenders. Respect in prison is like the respect you have out on the street with gangs, not necessarily Webster's definition of respect, okay? <clears throat> the reason that's important is the, the higher that level of respect, that you may not, may not trust each other, okay, in terms of staff versus offenders. So trust may still be an issue, but you can still have respect and a lower level of trust. But the more respect you have, the greater that trust level will be, and the more that respect grows, the higher that trust level will become. The more respect and trust you have, the greater the likelihood that you will not have problems in your facility. Here's why that's important. In the days to come as we meet, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the hands-off doctrine and the hands-on doctrine as it applies to corrections. We're also going to talk about the early years of corrections from ancient times all the way up to where we are now. Part of that is, <clears throat> is going to be related to how difficult and how brutal and how inhumane corrections was in the past. And there's a reason for that. In 1873, you had the Emancipation Proclamation sign, which did what? ended slavery, okay? All right. About 1875, uh, well, between 1873 and 1875, you have the 13th Amendment ratified, okay? And what's the 13th Amendment say? Anybody know? Give everyone uh, full equally uh, certain men of uh -huh. color the same um, rights as other Men? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Thirteenth Amendment uh, basically says this: involuntary servitude and slavery are prohibited in the United States and any territory under the jurisdiction of the United States, except for one group of people. Yes. 
those who have been duly convicted of a crime. Okay? Now that's important because as we talk about the hands-off doctrine, why did that ever occur? Why did prisons become so terrible? Why were they so brutal and inhumane? Okay? It's because around, again, around 1875, you have the United States Supreme Court, bless their heart, rule in Ruffin versus the Commonwealth of Virginia mm -hmm. that inmates don't have any rights. <clears throat> the court basically declared inmates to be slaves of the state. And as a result of that, if they don't have any rights, if they're slaves of the state because they've been duly convicted of a crime, like the 13th Amendment says, then there's no reason to provide for them or to treat them in any particular humane way. And so prisons and jails were terrible places to be. That situation called the hands-off doctrine meant that federal courts, legislatures, would not do anything to change the situation with prisons and jails and to take care of offenders. Then in 1861, or excuse me, in 1961, in the U.S. Supreme Court decision of Cooper versus Pate, the United States Supreme Court ruled that inmates have the right to sue prison officials for unconstitutional conditions. As a result of Cooper versus Pate, the hands off doctrine ended and the hands on doctrine began. And since 1961, there have been literally thousands of court decisions related to correctional operations and correctional management. Okay. Now, just because of that ruling in 1961, that doesn't mean that prisons and jails just instantly changed and got to be great places to be. Right? Still took time. Uh, some related cases. 1968, 1960, well, 1967 and 1968, the United States Supreme Court rules in Bounds versus Smith that inmates have the right to have access to courts, which told prison systems, you've got to provide either law libraries, lawyers, or both to offenders. They also ruled in another case uh, related to that, uh, almost within the next year, uh, that inmates, are to be allowed to help each other file their petitions with the court. That's where that term writ writer comes in mm -hmm. to play. A writ writer is typically an offender, an inmate that's in prison, who's helping, who's well versed in the legal system and helps other offenders write and file appeals with the state or federal courts. Okay. Or they're filing significant lawsuits against the system that you operate. So, those are things that we'll talk about as, as we move into the future. But the reason I bring all of that up is because many people today in our society believe that inmates don't have any rights. But what the courts have told us is that, yes, they do. Just because they walk into a prison or a jail doesn't mean that the Constitution no longer protects them. It still does. I know that there are people in prison and jails that have done horrendous, terrible things. <clears throat> and we sometimes think, well, they shouldn't have any rights at all because of what they did. But modern prisons recognize and protect the rights of offenders. You have to if you don't want to find yourself maybe going to prison yourself for civil rights violations or being sued for more money than even I can imagine uh, for violating the rights of an offender. So, questions about any of that? So, uh, Dealing with offenders is no easy thing to do. Many of them have psychological or emotional problems or they've got a 
substance abuse problem. Uh, so this next item is extremely important. What's the role of prisons and jails? We've talked about the five goals, retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, and restoration. Those are the five goals of corrections. But what about the role of prisons and jails? Okay. So to put that in a nutshell, it is not the responsibility of prisons or jails to punish anybody. Okay. Who does that? Who imposes punishment? The courts. The courts do. Okay. So it is the responsibility and role of corrections to ensure that the punishment imposed by the courts is carried out as follows. It has to be carried out legally, professionally, ethically, humanely. Okay? That's the role of prisons, to properly manage and supervise offenders who have been sentenced to corrections and there, if you're the warden, they're in your care. You are responsible for them. Okay. So it's your job to keep them safe and secure as part of the social control mechanism because keeping them safe and secure, preventing escapes, for example, also means that you're protecting the public. You're protecting society. You are a major part of that process. Okay. Questions there? I have several friends that are, are in law enforcement, and when we're together, uh, they'll remind me of what they used to do when I was working in prisons. They'd ask me, hey, you still working in prisons? Yeah, still do that. <laughs> and they would almost always follow that up with, gee, you're crazy, you know that? Mm. And I would tell them, well, you know, I, I try to emulate your craziness. I mean, you're a police officer. <laughs> You're crazy because how do I know that? It's because when you hear gunfire, you run over to where it is. And then they would remind me, yeah, but you're crazier than we are because you're stupid enough to lock yourself inside a building with nothing but bad guys and you don't have any weapons. Only the bad guys have got them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, now, in case you're wondering, is anybody more crazy than that? Yeah. I know groups of individuals who ride around on these big, huge red trucks that will run into a burning building when everybody else is running out, so that's pretty crazy. Uh, something I used to do in the military makes me crazy number four. Uh, worked with explosives. I'm not a terrorist, okay? not a terrorist. And, uh, and we did have a couple of folks that had shirts made up. And on the back of it, it said, Bomb squad, if you see me run and try to keep up. <laughs> so I was also on the hazmat team. Uh, and you talk about people that are just looney tunes, okay? That's people that will put on a plastic suit and then walk in a bunch of twisted metal trying to figure out how to put a chemical fire. Okay? Believe me, that ain't anything you want to do more than once. Okay. Anyway, uh, as we talk about corrections, okay? we want to make sure that we do it the right way. That court decision in 1961 in Cooper versus Pate, that was a result of some other things going on in our society back in the 1960s. Anybody remember uh, what all was going on back in the 60s? The riots. Uh, yeah, we had some riots, that was for sure. Over what? Segregation. Segregation and civil rights. Okay. So the civil rights movement got a tremendous boost in the 1960s. Okay. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was at the forefront of the civil rights movement, but we also saw some other things start to happen. We saw the first wave of the women's rights movement begin in the 1960s. We saw the first indication that we were concerned about the rights of children. And we saw that in the form of juvenile justice 
decisions coming from the U.S. Supreme Court, like in Ray Galt in 1968, that laid out all of the due process rights that had to be afforded to juvenile offenders as they were going through that juvenile uh, justice system. Okay, things like being read their rights, mm -hmm. being afforded the assistance of counsel, knowing the charge against them, being able to confront their accusers, being able to have people come testify on their behalf. All of those were rights that juveniles were provided as a result of in Ray Gall. Okay. And also in 1960, uh, 1961, obviously, with Cooper versus Pate, we saw the beginning of the inmate rights movement and how the courts began to engage in decisions at the state and federal level to enumerate the rights of offenders that must be protected uh, in the operation of correctional facilities. Right. So, as we look at correctional operation, that's why this purpose, the role of prisons, not to punish, but to maintain an environment that's safe and secure to protect not only the offenders and people that work in that prison, but to protect society as a whole. Right. Questions about that? Right. So if inmates have rights that you have to protect when they're in prison, is there any way you can limit what their rights are? Is it okay for you to limit the exercise of certain rights of offenders? Yes. Yes. Uh, Turner versus Safety, U.S. Supreme Court decision about 1974. I'm not getting my dates mixed up, but the, the name of the case is Turner versus Safety. The United States Supreme Court identified two primary reasons that would allow correctional administrators to limit inmate rights. Number one, maintaining the safety and security of the facility. I said, I said two reasons, there's three. Maintaining the safety and security of the facility is one. Maintaining the safety and security of the inmates as well as the staff and to ensure that rehabilitation programs can be completed. Okay. Based on those three things, limits can be placed on offender rights. <clears throat> and I want to give you a quick example of something I had to deal with uh, when I was at the Central Texas Detention Facility, the old Bear County Jail uh, here in San Antonio. Now, you can't find that anymore. That building's been torn down. So, uh, no, anyway, I had an individual come in who was a Satanist, okay? um, bona fide member of the World Church of Satan, Houston, Texas. Okay? So he gets into my facility. The first thing I get is a, a request form. I'd like to have a copy of a Satanic Bible. Okay, knock yourself out. You just have the church send you one. Okay. And then you have it. So, so he sends for one. He gets that. He's fairly happy. Next thing I get is an inmate request from him. I want to paint the inside of my cell all black. <laughs> no. This request is denied was the answer he got back. Okay. Um, so he complained about that because he all... The uniforms that we had inmates wearing were kind of a dark green. So we don't want somebody in an all black cell wearing a dark green inmate uniform because it might be hard to see. You know, so uh, so he got told no. Well, he didn't like that. So he filed a grievance against me and I told him no again. And so he, once he had my no, he sent it to the federal judge. I won't tell you which judge, but he sent it to the federal judge here in San Antonio. And I got a call from the court clerk. Uh, hey, can you come over and see the judge? Oh, okay, sure, no problem. <clears throat> so I go over there and the judge wants to know how come he he can't do this mm -hmm. and I said well your honor <clears throat> for one thing I don't have to do any of that for him why is that and I, and I would recommend if you're ever talking to a federal judge be nice okay? <laughs> don't refer to an inmate as a dumb bitch okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so just be careful about that that may get you held in Anyway, so, I said, well, Your Honor, the reason I'm not going to do that is because uh, if I give in to that, number one, I may have to give in to that person who wants to paint their cell all red or all blue or some other 
idiot color. And not only that, it's a security problem because that's gonna make it difficult for my officers to see into that cell. So that puts the safety of the inmate at risk. It puts the safety of the staff at risk. And I'd have to go in there and clean that up. We'd rather not do that. Well, are you sure those are, I said, Your Honor, maybe you need to take a look at Turner versus Safely. That's where you gotta be careful about telling the judge what to do, okay? Uh, are you saying I don't know the law? No, Your Honor, I didn't say that at all. I'm just saying that there's a U.S. Supreme Court decision that says I can limit inmate rights based on these three conditions. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Now, if you want to change that, you need to give me a written order Change that. But, Your Honor, no respect and disrespect intended. I don't think you can overturn the Supreme Court. What do you think? That was not a good thing to say. <laughs> and he, he basically said, Warden, you need to watch that attitude when you're in my office. <laughs> Your Honor, you're exactly right. I need to be more respectful. And I mean no offense, but it's my job to protect inmates, my staff, my officers, and to maintain the safety and security of my facility. And that's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to tell him you you don't have to, to do that. So the judge sent a letter back and told the inmate, no, you can't paint your cell all black. The next thing he wanted to do, he sent me a request saying, uh, Warden Proctor, I want to be able to do bloodletting. That's part of my religion. That's a part of the exercise of my religion. And I need a little exacto knife, and I want to be able to keep uh, mice in my cell so I can do bloodletting a couple of times a month. Hmm. <clears throat> that reply to him was, you must be joking. This request is denied. <laughs> so he filed a grievance. I tell him uh, basically the same thing. No, nope, you can't do that. That's a security issue, he didn't like that. He says, I'm violating his constitutional rights. So he sends that over to the judge again. And I don't even have to go see the judge. Uh, judge sends him a letter back, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, so my point is this, inmates have rights that you must protect. If you're running a correctional facility, whether it's a prison or a jail, inmates have rights that you have to protect. But you can legally limit what those rights are as long as you can justify it based on maintaining the safety and security of your facility, safety and security of the offenders and your staff and officers, and to ensure that rehabilitation programs can take place. As long as you can justify it based on those three reasons, you got no problem. Okay. Question or issues about that? Right. So, now, the reason I went through all of that is because some people might think, well, gee, Proctor, you're punishing that offender. No, I'm protecting my facility and the inmates and the staff. Right. So, uh, all right. So, uh, one of the things that we don't deal with very much is penology. The study of punishment and how effective punishment can be. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe one day here we can have a course that actually deals with that. So, all right. So here's what I want to do in the interest of time. Let me just kind of, oh, you want to know what corrections looks like? Here's where, here's how it breaks out. Nationwide, there are approximately 450,000, or excuse me, there are 4.5 million people on probation nationwide. Okay. Uh, so about 56% of all of the people in, under some correctional supervision are on probation. Probation is the most common form of sanction or sentence imposed by the courts in the United States for criminal behavior. Okay. So 21%, about 1.6 million people, are in prisons um, throughout the United States. Here in Texas, there's 145,000 people, give or take a few in the Texas prison system. The highest it's ever been in Texas, 172,000. Okay. So there's 111 prison units in Texas, currently 106 are in operation. Okay. Because the population has dropped to 
so much they've been able to actually close some prison units. They didn't tear them down. They're not obsolete. They could use them if they needed to, but they closed a few. Jails, about 10% of people under correctional supervision nationwide. That equates to about 780,000 people in the nation's jails from coast to coast. Okay? And then we've got about 12 people, or 12% of people on parole. That equals approximately 850,000 people nationwide in a parole status. Questions about any of that? Mm. <clears throat> All right. It's important to know that not everybody goes to jail just, or to prison just because they committed a criminal offense. That's why probation is used so much. But it's also important to keep in mind that 95 to 97 percent of all felony convictions at the state and federal level are resolved through plea bargaining. Okay. So, uh, just real quick, and then I want to move to your discussion question before we have, have to go. Do we have uh, an issue with regard to sentencing disparity mm -hmm. in our society and the criminal justice system and how it operates? Yes. Answer that is yes. Now, why does, well, now, why does sentencing disparity exist? Why does it occur? Uh, different income brackets, different race, um, okay. there's not enough room in the prison? Uh, sometimes, yes. Prisons get overcrowded, judges get frustrated. Right? So, but going back to, uh, sometimes sentencing disparity is based on money. Mm -hmm. One of the complaints about our, our legal system is that the, the amount of justice you can get is the amount of justice you can buy. The better the attorney you can afford, the greater the likelihood that you're going to come out better with the criminal justice system. And there's a certain amount of truth to that. Okay? It doesn't always work. Some people will hire attorneys that cost ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and still find themselves in prison for 12, 15, 20 years. Okay? But just because an attorney loses a case doesn't mean they're incompetent. <coughs> At least we, we hope it. I hope that's not the problem. All right? Race, let me deal with that for just a second. Most of the time, when it comes to racial disparity, the media likes to point to the issue of race. Now, have there been times when race has influenced sentencing? The answer to that is yes. And it's my hope that those judges are no longer sitting on the bench. Okay? Sometimes race is an issue for juries, but the difficulty we have there is that's hard to prove because we cannot sit in with the jury as they deliberate a case. And most jurors won't talk to anybody when they get out. So it's very difficult to conduct research about what was the jury dealing with with regard to the defendant, the accused, in terms of their sentence. Now, over the course of time, here's what research has sort of pointed out to us, that <clears throat> the number one factor in sentencing disparity is not money or race. What do you think the number one issue is? Play bargaining. Play bargaining. Okay. Now, why is that? Okay. Well, there are four types of plea bargaining. Okay. One is called charge bargaining. Okay. That's the first one. Charge bargaining. If I've just been arrested for murder, and I'm talking to the district attorney, or my attorney is talking to the district attorney about that, and I want to plea bargain something, what do you think I want to do? Lower charge. I want a lower charge. So I might convey to the prosecuting attorney, hey, well, you know what? Uh, I'll plead guilty to mur uh, manslaughter, seven to 10 instead of 20 to life. I'll plead guilty to manslaughter if you'll accept that and drop that charge down from murder to manslaughter, and we can get somewhere with that. Okay? And sometimes prosecutors will do that. Right? So what happens is 
I get charged with murder, but I get a lower sentence. And if you don't read the whole case, you can't know why that happened compared to that individual who also committed murder and got that 20 year sentence or got that life sentence, okay? So another type of bargaining is count bargaining, okay? I get arrested for robbery and so they bring me in, get me booked in, they start looking things over, they start completing their investigation and find out, you know what, Proctor's done 14 other robberies. Bless his heart. Okay. So there I am, I'm facing 15 counts of robbery. That doesn't look good. I'm being in prison for a really, 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 really long time for all of that. So what am I gonna ask the prosecuting attorney to do in a plea bargain? Run them all concurrent and get rid of some of them. Yeah, get rid of some of those counts. Let's, let's go from 15 down to how about five or six. Hey, I plead guilty to that. And I'd probably do 10 years, maybe 15, instead of 30 or 40, okay? So count bargaining, reducing the number of counts against me. Charge bargaining, reducing the charge that's against me, okay? Uh, then there is actual sentence bargaining. Here I am, I'm charged with murder, I'm looking at 20 to life, and uh, talk to the prosecuting attorney through my attorney to say, hey, look, uh, why don't I plead guilty to murder, but I want the minimum sentence, just 20 years. And the DA comes back and says, well, you know, I can't do that because you've got one other felony conviction. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do 30. I'm probably going to agree to that. Sentence bargain. Okay. <coughs> Then there's something we don't see very often called fact bargaining. Okay? Here's what that means. I am charged with murder, and if convicted, it's gonna be my third felony conviction, which means I'm facing a mandatory life sentence. Okay? So I might say to the prosecuting attorney, uh, you know that uh, shoplifting case I had eight years ago? Maybe we could just sort of forget that, write that off, you know, and so this will only be my second felony conviction and I'll plead guilty to 20 years for the murder. Save you the cost of the trial, how about that? And if that's my only offense, well, let's see, that's not, I've got another felony. I may have to do the 30 again, okay? But those are ways that we can plea bargain or that offenders can plea bargain and, and the end result of that is we see a wide range of sentencing disparity because of plea bargaining. We're negotiating charges, count, sentence, facts. We're negotiating all of that to reduce a sentence. I may be pretty successful at doing that because I'm a good negotiator and so is my attorney, but this other poor individual over here, it's just not working for them and they've been charged with the same thing I've been charged with, but they get a stiffer penalty than I do. Sentencing disparity that results from plea bargaining. That's one of the complaints about plea bargaining. Okay. So, having said that then, another reason for sentencing disparity, the app, uh, other than plea bargaining, if we want to call that number one, the number two cause for plea bargaining, or to me, Sentencing disparity is criminal history. That individual who is a first time offender is probably gonna get a lighter sentence than that individual who uh, has a criminal history. One, two, three different felonies, uh, misdemeanors and felonies combined, they're gonna get a stiffer penalty. Right? There are some individuals who have committed that third felony and their third felony conviction, according to the law, they get a mandatory life sentence. So sentencing disparity is a reality within the criminal justice system. Here's what I want you to understand though, that sentencing disparity in and of itself does not equal discrimination. If you wanna know if there's a discriminatory issue within a case, you're gonna to have to get the record for that whole case and read through it. 
but all too often because people don't in our society don't always understand how the criminal justice system works when they hear sentencing disparity coupled with discrimination they actually think that's true when in fact most of the time it is not there are times when it unfortunately has been and probably will be in the future but for the most part there are legal reasons for sentencing disparity like a criminal history and a criminal record another issue that the court will consider is what was done to the victim were they kidnapped tortured brutalized that will result in a stiffer penalty as a matter of law too or what if it's a hate crime can we enhance the sentence because somebody committed a hate crime yes there's that there's a statute here in texas just like other states where someone commits a hate crime and if they're convicted of that hate crime the sentence can be enhanced by another five years so the most important thing i want you to try to understand though is that sentencing disparity does not always equal discrimination against the defendant right? questions about that Okay. Um, so let's uh, left my toy over here. Sorry. Uh, so let's go. Uh, let's go here. Your discussion question is gonna ask you to compare and contrast two theories that are impacting corrections. Now, that begins on about page nine of your textbook and runs through page 15, I believe. Right? It also starts, there's also information that will help you with your discussion question, starting here with slide 19. Okay? So, I'm gonna cover some of this for you to help you with this discussion question, right? So, two major, well, first of all, there are several theories that impact on corrections. Right? Y'all are doing okay? Okay. Yeah, if you need to take a break, don't worry, but you can leave and come back. Feel free to do that. Uh, won't ever hold that against you. Uh, let me also say one quick thing. Because we start at 5.30, in the evening, I realize that uh, some of you probably have jobs, right? And it's all you can do to get away from the job, have time to stop at home, see the family, uh, or take care of things that you need to take care of before you get here. I would like for you to always be here at 530, but do not put yourself at risk to get here at 530. Don't come here with Bear County or SAPD or the University Police in tow either. Okay. So get here as safely and as quickly as you can. Don't ever worry about being late to my class because I know, based on where we are and where you might have to come from, that you might be a little bit late. Don't ever worry about that. I will never hold being late against you, never. And I will never embarrass you. If you happen to come in late, just come in, find a place to sit, and we'll carry on with carrying on. Okay? I won't ever call you out for being late. Okay? But please get here as safely as you can. Don't put yourself at risk trying to, uh, trying to get here just so you can say, I got here on time. Okay? Any, any issues there? All right. Okay, let's start with this first one. The classical school of criminology. How does that impact corrections? Well, there are some fundamental uh, principles related to this particular theory. Number one, Beccaria and Bentham, the two proponents of uh, the classical school. Uh, Beccaria, uh, he was an Italian scholar and sociologist. 
Jeremy Bentham was an English scholar and uh, sociologist. Uh, they were both concerned about how brutal and arbitrary the criminal justice system is, and even the fact that laws weren't written down. People didn't have access to the law, so they advocated for that. And um, Beccaria wrote this book called On Crimes and Punishment. That's a very short book. Uh, you can pull it up and get it for free on the internet if you want it. You can download it if you want to. It's free. Uh, and, and you can read it. You'd be, and the reason I'm talking to you about that is because when you read On Crimes and Punishment, one of the things you'll notice is that there's a lot of stuff in there that looks like it's in our Constitution as well. That's the kind of influence this theory and this work has had. Okay. For example, the Sixth Amendment. Anyone here know what the Sixth Amendment says you're entitled to? Okay, the first thing, one of the, well, the last thing that you're entitled to based on the Sixth Amendment is the right to counsel. Okay? So everything that comes before that is this. You have the right to a trial. You have the right to an impartial jury. You have the right to confront your accusers. You have the right to uh, a process that compels people to testify on your behalf. Okay? And you have the right to counsel. Okay? All of that's in the Sixth Amendment. If you read through on crimes and punishment, Vicarian and Bentham both said those are the kind of rights that people ought to have. Okay? They shouldn't go into the star chamber, which was used in England, and we would uh, and you would witness people going into the star chamber for a quote unquote trial, and then you'd never see them come out. Okay? That's because they were being put to death, and the bodies burned. Okay? So, uh, so. Beccaria and Bentham both kind of wrote anonymously uh, initially because they didn't, they were, uh, didn't want to be uh, executed by the government uh, for speaking out against what the government was doing. So, uh, so they provide a tremendous plea for reform in the judicial and penal systems throughout Europe. Instead of torturing someone to death, as a part of corrections, instead of doing something like this, uh, bringing two horses out and they're both about to go in the opposite direction and tying a person's leg to one horse, the other leg to the other horse, and then sending those horses off. You can probably imagine without me telling you what that would do to a person. Okay? To have someone drawn and quartered okay, was another form of punishment and sentencing. So this was a plea to stop all of that. Okay. Um, in terms of the classical school of criminology, its modern day version is called rational choice theory. Okay. Now according to the classical school of criminology, punishment, first of all, punishment should fit the crime. Here's what that means. That Punishment needs to be swift, certain, and severe. And here's what that means. That individuals engage in criminal behavior as a matter of free will, the exercise of free will. So there's nothing wrong with holding people accountable for criminal behavior, but the punishment needs to fit the crime. Okay, here's what that means. When we look at any type of behavior, human beings engage in, okay, we consider the benefit and the cost or the risk of that behavior. So if the benefit is high and the risk is low, then we're probably going to engage in that behavior. But if the cost is high and the benefit low, human beings will typically avoid that behavior. We refer to that as hedonism. People are hedonistic. They want to increase pleasure and avoid pain. Right? Now, when we talk about pleasure and pain, we're not talking about the sensual kinds of pleasure. We're talking about things like contentment, peace, joy. Those are the kind of things we want to experience. So, but we don't want to do that at great cost or risk. So, 
punishment that's swift, certain, and severe means deterrence. That when punishment is swift, certain, and severe, that in, it increases the risk or the cost of the behavior, reduces the benefit, and therefore deterrence occurs. People in society are convinced that because of this high risk and low benefit of criminal behavior, you need you want to avoid that. Okay. Beccaria and Bentham to that end believed that it was more important to prevent crime than to punish it. Preventing crime is still going back to deterrence and punishment that's swift, certain, and severe. You see how that's part of it? So when someone engages in criminal behavior, how does that impact, how does this theory impact corrections? It's that when we send people uh, to prison for criminal behavior, then that needs to occur quickly. We need punishment imposed through the courts that's swift, certain, severe, so that people know, you know what, if I do this, I'm going to prison, and it's going to be quick, and it's going to be severe enough. Severity refers to the ability to reduce the benefit of criminal behavior to the point that no one wants to do that. Okay? It's not about torture. It's not about being brutal. It's about making the cost of that criminal behavior so severe that nobody would want to do that. And we believe in this day and age that to do that, we have a sentencing scheme for various types of crime to say to offenders, if you engage in this type of crime, this is the kind of severe punishment, 10, 20, 15, or life in prison, those types of things, all right? So, uh, so the law then should be used to preserve public safety and order, not create disorder, all right? Questions or issues yet? All right, so based on this theory, Rational choice, people do things based on free will so they know what they're doing. And to this, even in this modern day, okay, uh, the law considers people to be competent and sane. Okay? If we want to talk about someone who is insane, and that is a legal status, by the way, not a psychological diagnosis, only a court can declare someone to be insane. So, if people are not acting with free will, then there must be something wrong. This theory would suggest, well, you need to do something about that. You don't need to be punishing uh, those that don't have free will, like those that may be suffering from a psychological disorder or children. Okay? So this theory is about dealing with adults, and again, maintaining public safety in order. All right, there we go. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, so here's something we were talking about from the Sixth Amendment. Victoria and Bentham believe that the accused person should be able to confront their accuser, know the charges against them, be granted a public trial before an impartial judge as soon as possible after the arrest. So what do we do here in Texas? If an individual is arrested for a crime, when do we want that trial to start? How many days? Anyone know? 180 days. Got 180 days to start the trial. Now, that doesn't hard, hardly ever happen, right? Sometimes it happens faster than that, but another reason for delays in the trial that extend that 180 days would be what? You're my attorney, and you're representing me, and I'm being charged with something here in San Antonio. I might ask you to go to the judge in the court and um, uh, make a motion for a what? Change of venue. Change of venue, because I don't want to be tried here in San Antonio. Two people know what's going on. Let's, let's move it to Comal County or Wilson County or Guadalupe County, or let's get out of San Antonio. So when the court receives that motion for a change of venue, what's the court have to do? All the information over to the other court. Okay, yeah, that and the, 
the court here in Bear County has to have a hearing to determine whether or not that motion is going to be granted. That so, buys you time. what's that? That buys you time. Yeah, that buys some time for the defense attorney, um, and it buys time for the prosecution. But the point I would make is there are all kinds of motions, motion for a change of venue, motion for the suppression of evidence that was perhaps obtained illegally, uh, a motion to consider competency to stand trial. That's a tough one, right? So there are all these motions that can get filed that the court's gonna recognize. So that slows this process down a lot because for every motion that's filed, the uh, district attorney might file a motion for a continuance. Well, every time a motion gets filed with the court, the court has to stop what it's doing and have a hearing. And that may not happen the very same day the motion is filed. It may take 30, 45 days to get that hearing on the court's docket, and then they can decide what to do. Okay. So these motions can slow this process down by 60, 90 days, right? And it carries out the amount of time that the trial is gonna take place, right? So, uh, so that slows the process down. So that's why here in our system, we don't claim to have punishment that's swift, certain, and severe. It's more like slow, maybe, and Oh yeah, gee, you got color TV to watch in prison and it's called the Iron Bar Hotel. <laughs> How bad can it be? Okay. So, um, all right, questions or issues about that? Okay. Here's something else that Terry and Bentham argued for, proportionality, okay? Um, the punishment should be proportionate to the harm caused by the crime. Now, between the 1700s and the 1900s, we don't see too much about proportionality until we get to 1977. In 1977, in Coker versus Georgia, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it is unconstitutional, <laughs> it is a violation of the Eighth Amendment to put people to death because they've committed a sex crime where the victim did not die. Because what was happening is people would commit a sex crime and they'd be sentenced to death and executed for it, even when the victim did not die. Okay? So, Coker versus Georgia put a stop to that. Okay? And the United States Supreme Court used what to justify that decision? The legal concept of proportionality. The sentence imposed, the punishment imposed against an offender must be proportionate to the harm caused to the victim. So, also 1977, Woodson versus North Carolina, the United States Supreme Court ruled that mandatory death sentences are unconstitutional, back to the legal concept of proportionality. Right. So, that's the kind of influence this um, uh, theory has had, not only on sentencing, but how we punish offenders and what types of punishment we impose through corrections, okay? So, uh, so again, punishment should fit the crime. Right? <clears throat> All right. uh, so, the only justification for punishment according to the classical theory is the prevention of crime. We call that deterrence, okay? that through the use of punishment, we keep other people from committing crime. Okay? Just out of curiosity, uh, what percentage of the population of the United States commits crimes every year? Anyone know? Like confirmed crimes or just crimes? Yeah, these are confirmed crimes that have been reported to the FBI. What percentage do you think that is? Okay. Quarter? Uh, it's 8%. Okay. About 8% of the population of the United States commits 70 to 80% of all the crimes. Okay. So, you don't need to know that if you're on who wants to be a millionaire and they ask you that question. Okay. Uh, all right. So, 
but we want to prevent crime. Again, preventing crime is better than punishing crime. Because if you prevent crime, what do you accomplish? Lower that number. Well, yeah. You certainly lower the number of people that are committing crime. But what about you? What about you as a member of society? Don't you think it's better to prevent crime than to punish it? I do. Because that means you're safer. That means there's less likelihood that you will become the victim of crime. That means the quality of life that you can have in a society is better. It's improved. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying that every problem goes away. I'm just saying that in terms of crime, preventing crime makes you and every member of society safer. You know, improves your quality of life. You know? So, all right. Um, so, some major, major principles of the classical school of criminology. Uh, the purpose of punishment is crime deterrence, prevention. Um, to prevent crime, laws must be improved and codified. What's that mean? Written down so you can see it. See, that's a really nice thing about the law in our society, is you can go onto the computer and you can pull up any penal code from any state. You can look at the laws for the federal government. You can pull up Title 18, the criminal code for the feds. You can pull up the, all of the tax code if you want to bore yourself to tears reading that. Uh, but anyway, uh, but we've got access to the law so we can know what it is. And that's where some people get themselves in a wreck. When they do things believing that people don't know what the law is, thinking they can get away with it, and they get some pushback from that. School boards are finding that out rather rather quickly. All right, so, oh, and by the way, parents that are trying to protect their children are not terrorists. I don't care what the Department of Justice says. Um, all right, so, um, Trying to think if there's anything else um, about the classical school. So while I'm thinking about that, do you have any question about the classical school and how it impacts on corrections? Okay. All right. Let me see if because uh, there's quite a bit here. Uh, oh, just as an aside, Jeremy Bentham designed what is referred to in terms of prisons as a panopticon. And that's what this is. This is his original rendering of a panopticon. This is the use of one in reality. This is stateful prison. This is referred to as the roundhouse. There are two of these uh, type structures uh, at stateful prison in Illinois. Okay? Uh, the officer inside this tower and I know that you can't see it from there, but the officer inside that tower can see into every cell on every tier, and there's four tiers of cells. Up here at the top, there's a catwalk where there is sometimes an officer uh, with an AR-15. Okay? Uh, this officer down here stays down here and controls traffic in and around this area. Any inmate that gets into this area without permission can find themselves in rather serious trouble. Um, there's only one door to the tower, it's right here. Uh, there's a camera, again, I know you can't see it, but there's a camera right up here in the corner so that anybody that wants inside that tower, you have to face the camera, hold up your ID, and they better match. Okay. So uh, that way that door can be open and that person up in the tower can be relieved uh, and the next shift can start. So if that's what, uh, oops, uh, that's what the panopticon actually looks like in use, questions there. All right. Uh, okay, so I think we've dealt enough with the classical school unless you have a question. Real quickly, 
The next theory, next major theory dealing with corrections is the positivist school of criminology developed uh, for the most part uh, by Cesar Lombroso. Uh, Lombroso wrote on, uh, on the criminal man. Uh, he dealt with a lot of the biological factors and focused on the biological issues that he thought contributed to criminal behavior. Lombroso believed in the born criminal. Uh, that in individuals engage in criminal behavior because of genetics. We know that not to be true today. There is no crime gene, there's no warrior gene that causes an individual to act out right, in, a, in, a criminal, uh, in a criminal way. Uh, there is no one single gene that does anything. Right? Kind of think of it this way. Uh, let's say you had a farmer driving down the road that had uh, cotton seed in those big cotton seed sacks and one of them was ripped open and the cotton seed is kind of blowing out and falling on the pavement. What's he going to do on the pavement? Nothing except blow away. Genes are the same way. Uh, we can look at gene after gene after gene and, and it all uh, individually accomplishes nothing. In order for genes to have an impact on behavior, or human development, we have to have combinations of genes. Right? So, question about that. Okay, now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that Lombroso was completely uh, off the mark, because here's what he believed. He believed that individuals that engage in criminal behavior are suffering from a social pathology Okay, so first of all, what's a pathology? That's a disease. Okay. COVID-19 is a pathology. Okay. Uh, but what about, um, uh, what about depression? Is that a pathology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a psychological pathology. Okay. So schizophrenia is a psychological pathology. Someone is suffering from that disorder. Okay. Measles are a pathology and someone can suffer from that medical disorder just and they can suffer from psychological disorders as well. Okay. Substance abuse. Substance abuse. Addiction is a uh, psychopathological disorder. Okay. All right, now, coming back to the positive school of criminology. Lombroso believed that people that commit crime do so because of internal forces, mostly genetic or biological, and external forces over which the individual has no control. Where the classical school of criminology is a free will theory, a rational choice theory, okay? positivist criminology is deterministic. The behavior of an individual is determined by internal and external forces over which the individual has no control. Right? So, to that end, Lombroso believed that in order to deal with criminal behavior, the punishment needed to fit the offender. Classical school, punishment needs to fit the crime. Positivist school, Punishment needs to fit the offender. And that's because Lombroso believed that these people that are suffering from this social pathology called criminal behavior need to be rehabilitated, treated, and cured. So his theory was based on a medical model that influences our system today with regard to the use of probation, trying to tailor punishment to fit the offender. Probation, a suspended sentence, okay? And I know we've got a chapter on probation, but probation basically is this. Uh, when I get uh, charged with a crime, I get found guilty, and I get sentenced to, let's say, two years in jail. 
But the judge then says to me, I'm going to suspend that sentence. You're not going to jail, but I'm putting you on probation. And I'm now under the supervision of a probation officer for that two-year period. Unless the court releases me early. Okay? So, trying to tailor punishment to fit the offender. The same thing happens when we send somebody to prison with this that uh, this theory supports what we call indeterminate sentencing, where an individual can be sentenced to 10 years by the court, sentenced to prison for 10 years, but that's not how long they stay in prison. And the reason for that is because we have something called parole, where the individual sentenced to 10 years by the court goes to prison and because of good behavior, working rehabilitation programs, working educational programs, conforming to the rules of the prison system, that individual then earns good time credit. And when that good time credit and calendar time equal half of their sentence, they're eligible for parole. So let's say that that person that got that 10 year sentence Let's say that, uh, you know, they've been in prison for two and a half calendar years. They've not gotten in any trouble. Their good time credit equals another two and a half years. So what is that? That's five years. That's half that sentence. At least on the books, it's half the sentence. So because the person has done well with their institutional behavior, let's say hypothetically speaking that when that calendar time and good time equal five years, the parole board says, we're going to let you out so that you can complete your sentence out in the community. You're not going to do your whole time in prison. So when I get out of prison, what happens to my good time? It disappears. So the only thing I have to put toward that 10-year sentence is the two and a half calendar years that I was in prison. So how long am I going to be on parole for a 10-year sentence? Seven, uh, seven and a half years. years. Yeah, seven and a half years. Seven and a half and two and a half, that's 10. Okay? So that's a long time to be on parole, but sometimes that's the way it works out. So all of that is based on this theory, trying to treat offenders, trying to tailor the punishment to fit the offender, to keep them in prison only long enough to secure conforming behavior through treatment and rehabilitation, and then release that person back to the community in that parole status, since that's what we do today. All of that is because of this theory and the medical model of treatment of offenders that this supports. So, questions or issues? So, all right. So, I think. Okay. I think we'll be all right. Uh, so, questions or issues about anything related to this? More importantly. As you think about that, do you have any questions that you want to ask that will help you with your discussion questions? So, first of all, any questions about anything you've heard tonight at all? Anything? Okay. And then second again, just to make sure, discussion question, these two theories, anything you want to ask about those in terms of how they impact on corrections. So the discussion board has to be at like a, a stage last or like uh, I would I was the shortest good response I've ever seen for this question is a page and a half. Okay. My answer to this one is almost two and a half pages. Okay. Now I'm not expecting you, and I appreciate you asking that question. It helps remind me to tell you this. I'm not expecting a PhD response 
<laughs> from you, although if you want to give me that, you can. All right. But what I'm looking for, again, has nothing to do with word count. What I'm looking for is the quality of your response to the discussion question. How well do you respond to the discussion question? Do you do a good contrast and compare of these two theories? Um, do, you, do you talk about some of the basic principles of the theories? It may not be all of the principles of these theories, but at least some of them. Do you at least mention a little bit about the concept, the perception of Beccaria and Bentham and Lombroso uh, to keep everything in context? Um, those are the kind of things I'm looking for as you respond to your discussion question. Now, some of you may be able to do that uh, in a very precise and concise way so that it's about a page and a half, maybe a little more. Some of you, on the other hand, may want to elaborate more or you express yourself differently, you write differently, and so your response might be two pages long. Okay? The longest response I've ever gotten to this from a student was four pages. But they also went to an outside source to help beef up their response. You don't have to do that. Everything you need to answer this question is in your textbook and on this PowerPoint. In fact, every question is designed that way. In case you're wondering, well, gee, Proctor, why'd you do that? It's because I want you to read the book. I can't cover every single thing in class. We'd be here all night, okay? So I want you to read the book. That's why. Is this the best book there is? Well, it's close to it. It's my number two choice, okay? And it's an excellent book about corrections. I want you to read it. I want you to study it. These discussion questions are designed to put you in the book so that you can get more perspective than even what I can provide for you. You, know? you don't respond to, to anyone? No, you don't have to respond to anybody else in the class. You're just talking to me. Okay? I will respond back to you. If you get anything less than the total points for your discussion question, I will respond back to you. Okay? If you get all of the points for your discussion question, I'm just gonna tell you this is great, excellent job, Keep up the good work, that kind of thing, okay? So, again, I'm not the least bit concerned about word count. And I will tell you this, one of the reasons why I've said that a couple of times now is uh, uh, I had a student once complain uh, that I need to uh, follow my own grading rubric and uh, deal with the word count. The problem is there's not a thing about word count on my discussion boards, in the syllabus, on the schedule, or anywhere else. I never talk about word count to tell, except to tell you word count is unimportant to me. That's why you don't see anything about that. I give you an idea of how many pages it's probably going to take for you to answer the question. Now, if you give me a three or four sentence paragraph, uh, it's okay with me. You just won't like the grade you get. Okay? So, uh, that's, not, that's not a threat, that's a fact. Okay? You just can't answer this. Uh, I mean, when you look at the number of slides alone that deal with these two theories, okay, you should be able to conclude you can't answer this in a paragraph. Okay? And on the instructions on Blackboard, it actually tells you minimum response, one and a half pages. It actually says that. So, there we are. Well, we so, have a lot to use um, additional outside sources as well rather than the textbook at least. So if, absolutely. If you choose to use an outside source to help respond to the discussion question, the only thing I ask is this. Number one, if you use that outside source, make sure you properly cite it and reference it in your discussion question so I can know what part you're using. And then give me an APA citation for that reference, that outside source at the bottom. Because I will go find it. Okay. 
word to the wise. Don't try to, no, I don't want to put it that way. A, a word to the wise to be careful about your references. Because if I can't find it, then I'm going to wonder how in the world you do it. Because with all the research I've done, I'm pretty good at finding just about any source you can come up with. Okay, so uh, and has that ever happened? I've had people uh, use an outside what they said was an outside source, and then I go look for it, and I can't find it anywhere on the internet. I even came back out here to the IT folks and asked them to see if they could find it. They couldn't find it either. Then I went to the library to see if they could find it, and they couldn't find it either. Well, three strikes and you're out. So, so I will look hard for whatever you tell me you're using. Right? Now again, you don't have to use an outside source, but if you do, rest assured uh, that will have some benefit to it. Okay? Uh, so any other questions about that? All right. Uh, and I think we're going to call it a night. Uh, so. As you're getting ready to leave, let me say this. Thanks for being here. I truly appreciate the fact that you're here. Uh, I appreciate your patience and understanding as we got 